Well, welcome everyone. It's um, really my great pleasure to welcome you all and wonderful to see uh, what would amount to a nice room full of beaming faces here. Uh, it's also nice to see we've got some participants from far afield as well. So welcome everyone. Um, it's a, a real pleasure to introduce uh, today's presenter, Sarah Ramsden. She's uh, doing a PhD in my lab and today is her prospectus seminar. So um, I think this is one of the uh, first few prospectus seminars that our department is having. Um, and we feel it's a good opportunity uh, relatively early in the um, process of the research to present plans and ideas and as the case may be some preliminary uh, data to an audience, get some feedback let people know what uh, what the students are up to. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Sarah. And um, yeah, over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Hi all, I'm Sarah Ramsden. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm in my fourth semester as a PhD student in Ronnie Baker's lab. And today I will be presenting my dissertation perspective about integrating acoustic tracking and stomach content analysis in order to determine why red drum use the habitat they do. And I wanna emphasize that why. As a movement ecologist, I spend a lot of time looking at when and where fish go where they do. But getting at the why is how I'm hoping to contribute something new and valuable to the field of movement ecology. So before I really dig into it, let me give you an outline of where my research is heading. I'm going to start by just grazing the surface of my literature review chapter to introduce the idea of how important it is for fisheries managers to know not only where critical fish habitats are located, but also to understand what fishery species are using those habitats for. And an effective way to get at this why is to combine acoustic telemetry, a technology that's all about where and when, with other well-known research techniques. And then I'm going to spend most of this presentation talking about my research chapter. To begin my integrated analysis of trophic and movement ecology, I will first describe the general diet of red drum from along the Alabama coast, paying particular attention to how their diet changes as they age and grow. Then I will describe how red drum move through and select habitats in the restored seascape near Little Bay off the coast of Bayou La Battery. This site is unique in that it includes a substantial river, it includes a variety of shoreline protection structures, and it also includes a sheltered bay that's fed by a series of tidal tributaries. Again, I will be paying special attention to how red drum of different size classes use habitats differently over tidal, diel, and seasonal cycles. From this base scale analysis of red drum movement, I have chosen a site to deploy a fine scale acoustic tracking array. This relatively new technology allows me to analyze red drum movement patterns at the microhabitat level, distinguishing the positions of individual fish with about one meter accuracy. I will then combine this detailed movement ecology with my understanding of red drum's diet and digestion rates to assign functional values, for example, foraging or sheltering to the habitats red drum use. And then finally, I will wrap up my presentation with a discussion of future directions that with a little luck and time, my research could possibly take. So why research fish movement ecology? So the Sustainable Fisheries Act in 1996 is a 1996 addendum to the Magnuson-Stevenson Fishery Conservation and Management Act that calls for the long-term protection of fisheries habitats. It requires that fisheries management councils identify essential fish habitats as well as minimize threats to those essential fish habitats and take steps to conserve and enhance them. However, most essential fish habitat designations are too broadly defined, and they're defined at scales that are really too large to be useful to managers that have limited um, conservation resources and funds. For example, here on the left, colored in red, are all the habitats considered essential to red drum. And on the right, highlighted in red, are all the habitats considered essential to commercial shrimp. So, as you can see, these are huge areas and it would probably be impossible to protect them in their entirety. So how do we prioritize what to devote our limited financial resources to protecting? Well, that's where the why fish use the habitats they do comes in. Fishes use habitats for a variety of reasons. They use them for foraging, for sheltering, for spawning as nursery habitats and as just pass-through movement corridors. 
And the survival of a species depends on its ability to access all of those necessary habitat types. So accordingly, to effectively conserve fishery species and prioritize locations to protect, we must identify the functional values of their habitats so that we can ensure that habitats of each type are protected when we're divvying up our limited conservation and restoration resources. But once we figure out where fish are located, short of following them around and watching them, how do we figure out what exactly they're doing? So Taylor et al. in their 2017 review of how acoustic tracking has aided fisheries management in Australia said it quite succinctly. Acoustic telemetry is at its most powerful when it is used as a complementary tool combined with other data sources. For example, Rooker et al. in 2018 combined acoustic tracking of a snapper, acoustic tracking of a snapper predator, barracuda, and dietary tracers to describe the functional values of Caribbean microhabitat. They found that during the day, snapper closely associated with patch reefs and mangroves, so these highly structured habitats. But at night, the snapper moved out of these structured habitats onto seagrass beds and sand flats during the night. And they went from selecting habitats that didn't overlap at all with their predators' uh, home range to selecting habitats that very much overlapped with their predators' home range. And what Rooker et al. found using isotopic analysis of muscle tissue from the snapper, they showed that these nocturnal habitats were really important for foraging, as most of the carbon in the snapper's diet was derived from sand flats and seagrass beds. So Rooker et al. determined not only where the snapper were, the mangrove versus the sandy habitats, but also why, shelter, versus, shelter from predators versus foraging. Another example is Payne et al.'s 2014 study. They combined acoustic tracking with gut content analysis to show that mulloway moves significantly less during periods of high boat activity and associated noise, and that during those periods when the fish are moving less, they are frequently detected with empty stomachs. They're frequently found with empty stomachs. So this is a slightly different usage of acoustic telemetry and that they calculated frequency of fish movements instead of home range size or habitat selection. But this study still serves to demonstrate the power of using multiple complementary data sets to get at why fish move or why fish don't move in this case, where they do. So for my research, I will also be combining acoustic tracking data with gut content analysis. However, I will be using different acoustic tracking metrics and adding some details about prey digestion. So using this integration of red drum movement and trophic ecology, I will assess the functional values of red drum habitats, as well as describe how those functional values change ontogenetically. So first, I need a robust red drum gut content data set, which brings me to the second chapter of my dissertation about ontogenetic shifts in red drum diet. The objective of this chapter is to quantify changes in diet that red drums exhibit as they age and grow. I must acknowledge that a great deal of work has already been done describing red drum diets and how they change through ontogeny. For example, this is a table from Overstreet and Hertz 1978 analysis of red drum diets showing how the frequency of occurrence of a variety of red drum prey items changes as red drum grow. And this is a figure from Sharp and Schlick's 2000 analysis of red drum diet, showing how the average size of various red drum prey items changes as red drum grow. Which of course begs the question, why am I doing again work that has already apparently been done? Well, in order to assign functional values to red drum habitats in and around Little Bay, I need a site specific understanding of their diet so that I can relate detailed patterns of prey consumption and digestion to specific habitat features and environmental conditions throughout my study region. My methods for this chapter are pretty standard for gut content analysis. I have stomachs collected from all over the Mobile Bay area as indicated by all of these yellow push pins. Most of the stomachs were donated during the 2019 Alabama deep sea fishing rodeo, but I also have fish that have been don donated by Alabama's Marine Resources Division and by local anglers. Before dissecting the stomachs, I weigh them whole and compare stomach weight to total fish weight in order to calculate a gut fullness index. Then I open the stomachs and identify prey to the lowest taxonomic level. Where possible, I also measure the size of prey items, typically total length for fish and 
uh, fish and shrimp and carapace wit for crabs. And then finally, I assessed the degree of digestion that prey items have been subject to as per the methods of Baker 2006 and Buckland et al 2017. And I'm going to discuss more about prey digestive states in chapter five. So thus far, I have processed 174 red drum guts, some fish ranging in size from 77 millimeters total length to 949 millimeters total length. And most of those fish are slot sized or slightly smaller than slot. Of those 174 fish, 123 have had prey in their stomachs. And it appears that red drum are less likely to consume shrimp. And that's indicated by the white area on this stacked area chart as they age and grow. In contrast, red drum seem to increase their likelihood of consuming fish as indicated by the gold area on this stacked area chart as they age and grow. And then at the moment, based on my preliminary analysis, there's not much of a trend in red drum likelihood of consuming crabs as they age and grow. So this is obviously a pretty coarse preliminary analysis of my data. I have an extensive photo library from my gut processing and my goal is to start identifying these prey items to lower taxonomic levels than crab, shrimp, and fish. Uh, this is probably gonna be the family for crustaceans and other invertebrates, but for fishes at least, I expect to be able to identify a lot of my samples to genus or even species level. But how do you identify a species? Something that looks like that. So fish have bones in their ears called otoliths, the shape of which are species specific. And these hard structures are the very last part of the fish to digest. In fact, as often as not, I don't find something that's as obvious as these fish fillets. Sometimes I just find dozens of otoliths loose in the fish gut's goo. So this is a picture of some otoliths. They're all from a single fish stomach that I picked out and cleaned. And they're currently saved in a 96 well plate waiting to be identified to species level. And the reason I can do this is because Polly Strawn, our summer intern, and Frank Delonzo, our technician, have been pulling otoliths from literally hundreds of fish that we've collected in Thames from Point of Pines. And they've been compi compiling these images into an otolith catalog. So the long-term goal of this catalog is to make it open access, to make it interactive, make it collaborative, and allow other fisheries researchers to add to it as they collect specimens as well. And there's even more that I can do with Frank and Polly's otolith catalog than just identify fish to species. Turns out there's a really tight correlation between the weight of a fish's otolith and the fish's total length. So using the regressions that Frank and Polly have calculated, I will be able to weigh the otoliths that I find in my red drum stomachs and essentially recreate the fish that they came from. I'll be able to describe not only how the species of fish red drum eat changes as red drum grow, but also describe how the size of the fish prey red drum eat changes as red drum age and grow. Similar correlations have been found by Scharf and Schlick in their 2000, in 2000 between the length of the inner orbital notches of blue crabs and blue crab carapace width. In general, when I find digested crabs, they are either intact and look like a crab or they're in completely unidentifiable fragments of carapace and legs. But using Scharf and Schlick's regression with the right identifiable bit of crab shell, I could in theory reconstruct the size of blue crabs consumed by red drum and accordingly describe, in addition to their fish prey, how the size of red drum crab prey changes as red drum age and grow. Now, there are, of course, a lot of factors that are going to affect the size, the type, and the species of prey that I'm going to find in red drum stomachs. It's way more than just the size and the age of the red drum. I am going to have to examine the date and season of capture, as well as the capture location when modeling these um, trends. But the last step in this chapter is to analyze the final gut data set using a variety of statistical modeling tools that will identify natural size class breaks that result from substantial differences in diet. I will then look to see if these diet defined size classes coincide with movement pattern defined size classes, which are the focus of my next chapter. So for my third chapter, I am using acoustic telemetry to track red drum of various age classes as they move and select habitats in the restored seascape around Little Bay. The objective of this chapter, similar to the objective of chapter two, is to quantify ontogenetic changes in red drum tidal, dial, and seasonal habitat selection. 
So in 2010, the Alabama Department of Natural Resources and Conservation received funding from NOAA to rebuild a 1.6 kilometer peninsula in Mississippi Sound, west of Mobile Bay, near Bayou La Battery. The Little Bay Peninsula was selected because it protects an extremely productive salt marsh estuary, Little Bay. So 100,000 cubic meters of sand were dredged to fill a gap that had opened in the peninsula. Over 100,000 plants were planted to stabilize the new sediment and concrete breakwater structures were built to protect the peninsula from wave action. In total, $3 million were spent to restore Little Bay Peninsula and the salt marsh habitat it protects. So because of this great expense, it's important that we work to understand how this project is benefiting fisheries species. So we deployed a bay scale tracking array of 14 BEMCO acoustic receivers this past September. So those are indicated by the white pins on the map. Receivers were placed to monitor various habitat types within this region. For example, these concrete breakwater pyramids protecting Little Bay Peninsula, the tributaries that feed into Little Bay, Little River, which feeds into the site to the west, and then these newly installed concrete breakwater pyramids, they look exactly the same as the ones on Little Bay Peninsula that have just been installed on Point of Pines Peninsula. So this is a pretty challenging environment in which to deploy an acoustic tracking array. It becomes extremely shallow during low tide, especially during winter, and it's noisy with boat traffic and the hard structures throughout have the potential to really interfere with the propagation of our acoustic tracking signals. But despite these challenges, the array does seem to be working really well, and we've rarely been unsure of the general locations of our tagged fish. So our tagged fish are surgically implanted with either a Vemco V7-2L or V13-1L acoustic transmitter tag. So the way this works is acoustic, trans, uh, acoustic tracking tags emit a unique Morse code-like signal. And in our case, they're emitting it at a random interval of between 200 and 300 seconds. So that's three to five minutes. And when a tagged fish swims within range of an acoustic receiver, the receiver records the fish's identification number, as well as the date and the time of that fish's detection. To date, we have tagged 22 red drum, ranging in size from 26 to 65 centimeters total length, and weighing between 0.14 and 2.5 kilograms, with a focus on fish that are smaller than slot size, so that's between 28 and 38 centimeters total length. Since the receivers were last downloaded at the end of January, we have collected a total of 113,671 detections, with the most frequently detected red drum being recorded 32,983 times, and the least frequently detected red drum being reported only 107 times. So based on my preliminary data analysis, it appears that red drum spend an increasing amount of time in Little River as compared to in Little Bay or its tributaries or along Point of Pine as fall progresses to winter. So for example, fish 38957 is a 29.8 centimeter fish that was tagged in a tributary of Little Bay. This fish spends most of its time in those Little Bay tributaries until about mid-October when it starts making more and more frequent excursions of increasing duration into Little River. Fish 38945 is a larger fish at 37.9 centimeters, and it was tagged near the breakwater pyramids of Point of Pines. This fish started spending an increasing amount of time in Little River starting in mid-December. So whether this slightly later departure into the river is because of this fish's larger size or some other environmental difference between Little Bay's tributaries and Point of Pines remains to be seen. But these are the kinds of size class related trends that I'm looking for in my data. So let's bring that back to the map. That smaller fish, 38957, was tagged here at Little Bay Tributary 2. And then it started spending more and more time in Little River starting in mid-October. The larger fish, 38945, was tagged here at the north end of Point of Pines, and it started spending increasing amounts of time in the river starting in mid-December. So, there's something special about R2, this northernmost Little River receiver site. It's the deepest, so possibly the warmest, spot in our entire study area. And it's highly likely that this deep hole in Little River serves as a thermal refuge for red drum in winter. We currently have a depth and temperature logger attached to that receiver so that we can try to tie some numbers to that trend. 
So the pattern of fish spending increased time upriver as fall progresses to winter holds true for fish that were tagged in Little River and so more or less never leave Little River as well. So before periods of non-detection, both of these river tagged fish were typically last detected by that upstream Little River receiver R2 that I just pointed out. And then after those periods, they're almost always first detected again by that same receiver, implying that when they're missing from the array, they are somewhere upstream of R2. The number and duration of their upstream non-detection periods has increased as we've moved into winter, as evidenced by the reduction in detection numbers for both fish as we moved into early mid-January. So one of our many next steps is to actively track these fish. We're gonna take a mobile receiver up past receiver, um, river receiver two to see if we can hear their tags singing in the upper river habitat. And then we can verify that that is indeed where these fish have migrated to for the winter when we're not detecting them on our broader array. So these two fish are similar in size, but I am really curious to know if fish of smaller or larger sizes they exhibit the same pattern of upriver winter migration, or if perhaps fish of different sizes begin a similar migration earlier or later in the season, like I saw in the fish tagged in Little Bay versus on Point of Pines Peninsula. So before we talk about some of the tidal trends I've observed, let me orient you to this figure. These are timelines showing where on an upstream downstream gradient, the greatest proportion of fish 38945's detection has occurred. The darkest blue stripes represent the most downstream site located here. The lightest blue stripes represent the most upstream site located here. The location of the gold box indicates the location where the fish was most often detected. And the uh, intensity of the gold color is proportional to how large that proportion is. So this dark gold color usually means 80 to 100% of the fish's detections were there. This lighter gold color is about 20 to 30% of the detection. And then the stripes of white are periods during which this fish was not detected at all. And I wanna emphasize how few tidal cycles there actually were that we didn't detect this fish. And that's really fantastic news for the arrangement and function of our receiver array. It means it's deployed in a way that we're hopefully unlikely to miss important shifts in red drum habitat selection. So this is the bigger of the fish whose seasonal movements I presented earlier. So let me draw your attention again to this early December period where the fish is spending most of its time at the downstream, uh, the downriver sites. And then starting towards the end of December, it starts spending an increasing amount of time upriver in Little River. So this fish and a few others also exhibited an interesting tidal movement pattern. Periods of rising tide are indicated on these timelines with black squares and periods of falling tide are denoted with gray squares and red drum appear to move against tidal currents, moving upriver on falling tides and back downriver on rising tides. So we suspect these tidal migrations are related to foraging for prey that is forced out of the marsh vegetation by falling tides. And we have plans to use red drum digestion rates and some depth loggers to confirm this hypothesis. So right now, I really do have a solid range of red drum of different sizes tagged. But if I truly want to understand ontogenetic shifts in habitat selection and movement patterns, I need some more fish of the extreme sizes. There's been a great deal of work done already acoustically tracking very large red drum, but far less has been done tracking very small red drum. And this is in part because historically, the size of red drum that could be tracked was limited by large tag sizes and what we call the 2% rule which is Winter's 1996 rule that states that the weight of a tracking tag should not exceed 2% of the weight of the animal to which it is attached. Well, Reed Nelson, who a lot of you know, who tagged red drum at the sea lab before me, told Ronnie and I that red drum are pretty hardy fish and that they can likely carry a tracking tag weighing more than 2% of their body weight. So in 2019, I set out to test just that. In controlled mesocosm, I exposed hatchery reared young of the year red drum to one of three treatments, a tag treatment in which I surgically implanted them with an acoustic transmitter, a sham treatment in which I performed the tagging surgery, but I never implanted a transmitter, and then a control treatment where the fish were handled, but only for measuring weight. And what we found were that the tagged and sham fish, so here depicted in the solid green and the green stripes, initially grew slower in the first 10 days 
than their untagged conspecific, so that's the white bars. However, after 24 days, their growth rates had compensated for this lag, and they were growing at the same rate as their untagged conspecifics. So the smallest fish in this experiment was 15 centimeters total length, and the tag weighed 5% of its body weight. So accordingly, the 2% rule appears to be overly conservative for red drum. And as soon as I can catch a few, I'm looking forward to tagging the, this never before tracked size class of fish in the field. I'm also extremely interested in what environmental changes may trigger red drum to change their movement patterns. For example, is there a threshold water temperature that cues red drum to start heading up river in winter? And do smaller and larger fishes have similar or different thresholds for triggering that kind of change in behavior? Looking at our preliminary red drum movement data, there's this, the relationship between heading upriver on falling tides and downriver on rising tides isn't always consistent. And I'm curious if it's not simply changing water flow direction that triggers up or downriver movements, but the degree to which tidal height changes. So is there a threshold water height at which prey species like crabs, shrimps, and small fish are forced out of the protection of the fringing marsh grass, and it's not until water levels drop below this that red drum make the upstream forage and migration. So this is something I can quantify and model with the depth loggers we've recently deployed at a few of our receiver stations. And finally, while I'm getting started by examining how these environmental changes affect red drum movement patterns on the scale of all of Little Bay, I also want to look at how they affect fish movement patterns on a microhabitat scale as well. And that's the focus of my fourth chapter. So for my fourth chapter, I will be using fine scale acoustic telemetry to track the movements of red drum around the newly installed concrete breakwater pyramids along Point of Pines Peninsula. The objective of this chapter is to quantify the residency of red drum among microhabitats within this restored seascape. So based on my preliminary data from chapter three, I identified a hotspot of red drum activity at the north end of Point of Pines, just to the west of the mouth of Little River. And I chose this location to deploy a fine scale acoustic tracking array. This site also includes a variety of microhabitat types, a series of breakwater pyramids and eroded man-made oyster reefs, seagrass beds, fringing marsh, and even the mouth of a small tributary. So fine scale tracking arrays consist of closely placed acoustic receivers. The array I plan to deploy will have receivers placed at within 50 meters of each other. So that's indicated by these yellow push pins on my Google Earth image. And that means that the receivers are going to have overlapping detection radii. And this overlap is what allows for the triangulation of the position of a detected fish with about a meter's accuracy. So this means I will be able to calculate the amount of time fish spend in proximity to the breakwater pyramids as compared to the various microhabitats protected by those pyramids, including the mouth of this tributary, the fringing marsh, the seagrass beds behind the pyramids, and the partially man-made oyster reefs that were originally constructed to protect Point of Pines from wave action. And an understanding of the differential use of these kinds of habitats associated with restored shoreline is really important when we're making coastal protection construction decisions. So the shallow depth of this site combined with the abundance of hard structures may affect the signal propagation of our transmitters and the detection efficiency of our receivers. So we're in the process of designing a detailed study to determine how shallow waters and concrete structure affect the effectiveness of fine scale tracking arrays in pinpointing fish locations. So we need to determine how the distance between the breakwater pyramids and the receivers affects, or hopefully doesn't affect, their shoreward detection range. And we also need to assess how well our array can pinpoint the locations of stationary tags throughout the site, essentially whether water depth Proximity to the breakwater pyramids or oyster reefs or seagrass will affect our ability to effectively locate fish. Now, this isn't to say that we're not sure if our fine scale tracking array is going to work. Our site is just pretty different from previous locations where this technology has been deployed. And we don't want to incorrectly make assumptions about how our array is going to function based solely on that, those previous works. So from the data I collect from the fine scale tracking array, I will be able to quantify fish preference for or avoidance of habitat. And this is done by comparing the distribution of a fish's detections to a random or even distribution of points. So this is an approximation of 125 evenly distributed points. So, and I wanna draw your attention to the eight 
or 6% that fall within the eroded man-made oyster reef habitat that's highlighted in yellow. So if the proportion of a fish's detections in a habitat is greater than the proportion that would randomly or evenly fall in that habitat, that is indicative of habitat, habitat preference. So in this case, if more than 6% of this fish's 20 detections occurred over the man-made oyster reef, it prefers that habitat. Conversely, if the proportion of a fish's detections in a habitat is less than the proportion that would randomly or evenly fall in that habitat, that is indicative of habitat avoidance. In this case, if less than 6% of this fish's detections are over the man-made oyster reef, it is avoiding that habitat. I will also be quantifying how fish move within each of these microhabitats. So are they moving around a lot or are they remaining mostly stationary? And these metrics will be critical in assessing habitat functional values in chapter five. So chapter five is really all about tying the previous chapters together. The purpose of this chapter is to combine what I learned about red drum diet with what I learned about red drum movement patterns to assign functional values to various microhabitats around Little Bay. An example of the kind of question I might ask while working on this chapter would be, what does it mean if I catch a red drum on the man-made oyster reefs at Buena Pines and find in its stomach a blue crab that looks like this? And just as an aside, this is an actual blue crab that I found in a red drum stomach. It was soft shelled and folded in on itself to the point of being almost unidentifiable. So it's one of my favorite gut content finds because I'm not sure the red drum that ate this crab could have managed it if the crab wasn't freshly molded. So the first step in this chapter is to run some digestion experiments similar to those of Baker 2006 and Buckland et al 2017 to determine how the appearance of prey in a red drum stomach changes after it is consumed. So after a period of acclimation and fasting, we will feed red drum housed in individual tanks a known prey item, most likely a blue crab, pinnaeid shrimp, or a cupaid, as these are the species I find most often in red drum stomachs. And then after they have been fed, we will call the red drum at regular intervals in order to dissect their stomachs and examine the digestive appearance of their prey. So pictured here are some examples from Buckland et al. of fish prey in increasing states of digestion. So in this first panel, we have a fish that's clearly undergone some digestion, but its head and tail are still distinguishable from each other. In this second panel, we've got lots of bits of tissue and bone that are identifiable as belonging to a fish, but we can no longer tell the difference between where the head of the fish was and the tail of the fish was. And in this third panel, all that remains of the fish that was eaten are its otoliths. So the next step of my integration chapter is to collect red drum from the various microhabitats associated with the Little Bay region. So this includes the microhabitats associated with point of pines, associated with the point of pines protection structures that I discussed in chapter four, but it also includes the tributaries versus the main body of Little Bay. And we definitely want to compare fish collected from upstream Little River to fish collected from downstream Little River at various tidal stages. And then we will dissect the stomachs of the fish we collect. And based on the findings from our digestion rate experiments, we will be able to calculate the time since those fish consumed prey. So by assessing the typical movement patterns of fish in a given habitat, as well as the typical digestive state of prey from fish collected in that same habitat, we will be able to assign a functional value to that habitat, such as foraging or sheltering or a movement corridor. So for example, if fish are typically stationary in a habitat and their stomachs and the stomachs from fish collected from that habitat are typically empty, we would probably call that habitat a sheltering habitat. Conversely, if red drum are frequently moving about in a habitat and when we collect them, their stomachs are full of fresh prey, we would call that habitat a foraging habitat. And lastly, we suspect that the daily tidal migrations we've observed a few fish making in Little River are foraging migrations. So with an understanding of prey digestion rates, we will be able to examine the stomach contents of red drum collected upstream and downstream in Little River during different tidal stages and confirm in what locations and at what tidal stages those fish are foraging. And finally, I wanna emphasize that we're not limiting our acoustic tracking or our gut content analysis to fish of any specific size class. So we will be able to describe how the functional values of these various habitats change as the fish age and grow.
So to wrap up this talk, I want to mention a few future directions we might take. So first, we have recently applied for funding that would allow us to deploy fine scale tracking arrays at two additional sites. So this region we've been working in around Little Bay is really awesome in that it contains four different man-made breakwater structures, all within a kilometer of each other, nice and close packed together. So I've talked about these breakwater pyramids on Little Bay Peninsula. I've also mentioned the identical pyramids on Point of Pines Peninsula and the old man-made oyster reefs that are on Point of Pines Peninsula. And then there is an additional restored shoreline here at Lightning Point. So this shoreline is made up of riprap breakwaters and behind those riprap breakwaters, uh, tidal, tidal tributaries have recently been built. Essentially they've, they've built some tidal creeks behind the riprap structures, it's really cool. Um, and I'd really like to compare how Red Drum utilized these various different types of breakwater structure, as well as examine how Red Drum's usage of these habitats changes as the structures become more established in the environment. So these point of pines, sorry, these little bay peninsula pyramids have been installed since 2010, whereas a lot of the other structures in this habitat have only been installed in the last year. And it'll be really interesting to see how red drum movements around them change as time progresses. I would also like to tag some additional important fishery species like sheep's head pictured here, speckled sea trout and flounder. I would like to add a trophic level to my fine scale tracking. So similar to Rooker et al's work with snapper and barracuda that I mentioned in my introduction, I want to look at how the movements of a red drum predator, most likely bulk sharks, affect the habitat selection and movements of red drum. And as I've dug into this restored shoreline angle of research, I've become really interested in how fish movement patterns are affected by man-made structures in general. So just around the corner from my little bay study site is Auburn's off bottom oyster farm where I would like to deploy another fine scale acoustic array to track the movements of various fishery species around those structures. So that would be kind of a lot for a single dissertation, but I would still love to answer all of these kinds of questions. The insights we could gather from these additional studies could be really valuable to fisheries conservation and management, especially when we're making coastal restoration and protection decisions. And with that, I would like to thank the folks without whom this work wouldn't have been possible. I wanna give a special thanks to my advisor, Ronnie Baker, as well as my prospective committee members, Mark, Mike, and Sean. I want to acknowledge my funding sources, Mississippi, Alabama Sea Grant, and the USA Department of Marine Science, as well as the Bullard Fund. Grand Bay NUR loaned us our first 14 acoustic receivers without which we couldn't have gotten this research started. And Sean Powers Fishery Ecology Lab has been loaning us various bits of equipment and technology while we work on acquiring our own, for which I'm hugely grateful. Alabama Marine Resource Division, as well as several recreational fishers from the Sea Lab have been donating me red drums of gut content analysis, which I really appreciate because I can't seem to catch single fish myself. I couldn't have gotten any of this work done without tech services help along the way or without the support of my fellow graduate students, especially those in the Baker Lab. And finally, I have to give a huge thanks to Frank Alonzo, who has been my patient right-hand man since he joined our lab. He's done everything from help me download receivers to catalog, uh, to catch fish, to dragging the boat out of the mud when the tide didn't rise like it was supposed to. Um, really, he's just a boost of morale and an excellent source of ideas. Um, and if you find that mission, you can't have him. <laughs> and with that, I would love to take any questions. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Excellent presentation. Um, so we're opening up for questions now. You can either uh, unmute, turn your camera on and um, ask questions or type them into the chat box and I'll read them out. So this chat stuff. Hey, Sarah, this is Dottie. You can't see me, I turned my camera off. Uh, <laughs> I got too much going on in the background. Um, really cool stuff. It's really exciting. Um, uh, my one question for you was, have you thought about for um, the gut content analysis using um, DNA markers to determine what's in their gut instead of um, otoliths? Although I think that's kind of really cool to like do that whole like big otolith kind of study. Um, 
have you thought about using DNA instead, essentially? I'm familiar with, well, vaguely familiar with stable isotopes and uh, DNA barcoding for looking at gut content. Right now, that's not really something we're considering. Um, assuming that red drum don't eat lots of super, super soft bodied prey, I'm thinking jellyfish and squid, a lot of their prey items are pretty visually identifiable. Um, so I guess the short answer to your question is no, we haven't really considered it, but we're aware of the technique. <laughs> Okay, so we have a, a question in the chat box uh, from Carl saying, nice work, Sarah. What do you think's driving changes in diet with ontogeny? Um, is it the, the relative sizes? Is it locational habitat changes or other behaviors associated with anti-predation? So if I had to guess, um, I would say it's probably a little bit of gate size so basically change, change in predator size makes it easier for larger red drum to eat larger prey and larger red drum swim a little faster. So we're more likely to be able to catch fish prey, which is more nutritionally valuable than say shrimp prey. Um, we're not sure yet if it's going to have to, if it has anything to do with ontogenetic habitat changes, that's part of the next sort of modeling step is to see if that, you know, decrease in shrimp consumption, increase in fish consumption coincides somehow with a, a change in habitat over the same change in size. So that would be really cool and that would be pretty indicative of this habitat is better for me at this size and it happens to have this prey item that's more abundant. Um, but right now off the top of my head, if I had to tell you, I'd say it has to do with the red drum are getting bigger, their gape is getting bigger, they're becoming stronger swimmers. And so they can take on stronger swimming, bigger fish prey that's more nutritionally efficient. Uh, storm events, prolonged physical mixing of shallow areas could affect red drum diet, i.e. increase the proportion of benthic prey items due to substrate disturbance. That sounds, sorry, that was a question from Blair. Um, so it's, do you think storm events are gonna increase red, or change red drum diet? I don't see any reason why it wouldn't um, because the other thing I could see happening is if a storm sort of caused all of the fish, all of the super mobile prey items to, to hightail it out of there um, such that all that remained for a little for a while was the less mobile prey items. Um, and that's the kind of thing that so right now I've really only looked at how prey um, modeled how prey changes on a size scale, but we do want to make sure we look at date and time of capture and location of capture so that we potentially see those kinds of um, environmental effects on diet and prey choice. Hey, Sarah, I really like your presentation. And I found it uh, particularly interesting that you're going to be tagging these uh, smaller uh, size classes of red drum. And in your experiment, you said that you measured the growth rate and how much they changed in growth over time when you tagged them. I was wondering if you looked at any uh, behavioral observations. I would be kind of interested to know if the greater weight causes them to have a dietary shift if they go for a slower prey species when they have more weight on them or if that would change their ability to go against the tidal current or if you've looked at behavior at all or have any plans to. Um, we would love to. It so I did these experiments in the, the Sea Lab mesocosms with Mobile Bay water. And I mm -hmm. stuck a camera in there and saw muddy, turbid water. Um, surprise. Uh, so that's a, a really awesome question. And if we can get another set of young of year fish, uh, a, a big enough set of young of year fish again, I would like to run the experiment in the indoor mesocosms so that I can watch them because I've heard I've read a little bit of both. I've read studies that suggest that too big a tag causes the fish to be more stationary just because they're dragging around all that weight. But I've also read that it may cause fish to move around more um, because they're having trouble compensating for buoyancy differences. 
So either one of those things could cause a, a decreased growth rate. They're either not foraging because they're weighed down by the tag and they're struggling, or they're having to burn a whole bunch of extra calories to compensate buoyantly for the tag uh, being in them. So the, those are the two kind of options as to why I think that initial uh, lag in growth happened. But in, in muddy Mobile Bay water, I wasn't able to observe it. So I, I would, I'd really like to run it um, with nice crystal clear water. Yeah, solid question, thanks. So I'm not really concerned about changes in growth rate at all. I'm at, more interested in whether it would have something go from uh, something sessile, that more fish can still compensate for their uh, decrease in growth rate because they're not able to chase down a fast fish. They just eat a lot of more slow prey. And so exhibit the same growth rate, but are completely switching their diet to a different food source. And that may cause them to change their location. It is one of the oh. things that I'd be yeah. wondering about. Um, so when I was feeding them in the mesocosms, I, I, they got frozen chopped up squid. So there was no, no choice. Um, that would be something worth looking at. We, in the acoustic tracking studies, we kind of operate under the assumption that the, the carrying around the tag doesn't cause the fish to act differently from an untagged pond specific. And that's a big assumption, but we, we do tend to make it. But I can see how in a mesocosm setting, you could add different live prey items to the tank and see if a tagged fish versus an untagged fish chose a different prey item. And that would be, if, I'm already got, if I've already got the mesocosm set up where I can see the fish, that would definitely be worth doing. Yeah. yeah. Just something to consider in the future. But yeah. I love your presentation. It's really great. Thank you. I, I just chime in here too with a point, uh, Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, <clears throat> even the, the heaviest tag to fish ratio in your experiment we're still talking 5% of the total body weight of the fish. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. It was, I think, 5.6 and it was a 15 centimeter total length fish. So, yeah. So, so just to put a bit of context around the, the idea of lugging around a heavy tag, it's the difference between 2% and 5%. I mean, obviously it's double the relative weight, but it's still only 5% of the total weight of the fish carrying it. Yeah. There's some good questions. Anyone else got questions?